Thanks, everybody, for coming. OK. Um, this is a dual presentation. My name is Michael Wong from IBM. And um, Alexei Batayev is from Intel. And we've both been working collaboratively with a number of people. And you can see it on the slide itself. Um, there are people from AMD who's been involved. There are people from IBM, um, our team. There's people, a large number of people from Intel that's been involved. Um, there's people from Texas Instrument that's been involved, as well as people from the Department of Energy that's been involved in, in all this. So I'll start off with a talk, um, with the talk, and then Alex A will join me, and then we'll, uh, and he'll show, he'll give you a demo of uh, what, how, how it looks, okay? Um, so a couple of things, obviously, uh, some, some general disclaimers and dis acknowledgements. Um, this is the work of a large body of people that was involved, that's been involved with OpenMP, as well as research and academia. Um, so if there are any, any remaining errors and mistakes and stupid <laughs> mistakes and things like that, they're all mine. I claim all of it, so it's not, it's not theirs. Any, and the usual legal disclaimers, I'm gonna, we're going to be using um, things that represent trademarks and logos from various companies. Um, so um, if, if it belongs to them, then they, they, they own those trademarks. So just to give you an agenda, uh, some idea, I want to give an idea about, so other speakers have talked uh, this week have talk about, talked about GPU programming. And what we're going to talk about is just to give you an idea that we're trying to design in a high-level GPU programming language. And as such, I want to give an overview of what it takes, some of the challenges involved, what it means to do accelerator programming. And we're going to look, do a quick tutorial about the OpenMP 4.0 accelerator programming model. And then give you an idea about the target independent offload design that we've been working on for the last two years that we put on the reflector to show what, 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 what we're talking about. As well as, um, and then Alex, they will come on and show what the Clang OpenMP offloading looks like in a, in a kind of a movie demo so that you can follow what it, what it does. Okay. So right off the bat, how do, you, how do you program GPUs? Seems like a simple question, and some of the people in here already have answers to that. Well, it turns out it's not as simple as you think. I mean, I'm sure many of you guys came on an airplane. I don't know many of you guys that came on an A380, one of those big jumbos that has two decks on them. The reason airlines love those, love those is because they have a tremendous, they give you um, a tremendous amount of return on value for the company. You, they, can, they carry something like 300 people across the, uh, across the Atlantic, 400 people. But in order to do that, they do something very special that you might not realize. They might not fit in a normal terminal. So sometimes you might have to put all the passengers in the holding tank which takes a bit of time, maybe half an hour to get set up. And then this holding tank belongs in this larger terminal so that the passengers goes on to the plane. And then they, it comes over the, the, the Atlantic very fast, brings a lot more people, a lot more money. But at the other end, you don't have a terminal that fits that either. So they also go, have to go into a special terminal with a special holding tank. And then you get offloaded. At the end of the day, the amount of time is a little shorter than it takes. you know. And, but, you, but the airlines love it. There's only one problem with this airplane, and that is that if one person wants food, everybody has to be served food. Wait a minute. That's, that is what they do now, don't they? Right? That's not so bad. The other part about this airplane that, that is strange is that if one person wants to go to the bathroom, everybody has to go to the bathroom. Now, you might be, at this point, you might be thinking, I'm not sure I want to go on this particular airplane. But this gives you some idea what GPU programming means to some extent. This is an interesting analogy I heard from one of my professors before. But here's what, why GPU is important right now. It's not a flash in a pan. Right now, the US Department of Energy is on a race to exascale computing. Now, you don't know what that is. That's 10 with 18 zeros behind it. That's floating point operations. The little red line there is showing where the top computer is right now. It's getting really close. Okay, I'll show you what the, some of those computers mean. The other lines aren't that important. One is just the sum of all the supercomputers, and the other one is, the, I think it's like the slowest one. Of the top 500 computer contenders, these are it right now. This one at the top is the Chinese Tianhe 2 supercomputer. That's the red line. Okay, it's using an Intel Xeon 5 using the OpenMP memory model to try to get there. The one at the bottom left is the Oak Ridge Titan computer. Okay. It used to be at the top, but it no longer is. It uses NVIDIA um, um, GPUs. Um, the one on the right is actually one of my, is my company's machine. It's, a, it's, a, it's an IBM Sequoia. It's not even in the running. It used to be the top, but because it doesn't use GPUs, and it, 
GPUs, it's an older generation, it's no longer in the running, okay? So that's in the high performance world. But GPU programming is also for the consumer world. And as some of the talks we've been hearing, you can see that we have been messing around with GPU programming for quite some time with different programming models for the last six years. And we've learned quite a lot from them. We started with something that's very shader-specific spe language, like OpenGL, DirectX. Gentleman before me talked about CUDA, which is a company-specific language that, that targets NVIDIA and a few other devices. Then you have the open efforts, which tries to give you a high-level way of doing it that targets multiple devices. Because people thought, well, you know, it would be best if these guys can also target Intel. So there were some of the questions were specifically asking about that. So OpenCL is a low-level, fairly low-level functionality methodology. OpenMP tries to do it at a very high level. OpenACC also tries to do it in a very high level, but without any specific host support. It leads on OpenMP for that. Then C++ AMP comes in, and it's more specific for C++. Now, other efforts, more recent efforts, is HSA, the HTC compiler, SICL, okay, and that's much more closely married to C++. Vulkan is an offshoot for OpenGL from Kronos that's coming in. And soon we're going to have a preview of the C++ WG21. I'm the chair of SG14, and we're looking, and, and, which, is a, which is a study group for gamers and low latency and financial applications. And these guys are looking for a GPU programming language and tasked us with designing such a language. And we're in a great position now to take the learning from all these other languages and figure out a way to integrate it into a nice parallelism TS2. We have TS1 published. And so that it would contain what it would look like. And in my next talk, I think um, Tanya actually mentioned that the LLVM HPC talk, my next talk's there. And I'm going to go show a preview of what that might look like for parallelism. This is actually what the parallelism TS, without going into specifics, it gives you a way to annotate um, STL algorithms with either sequential, parallel, or parallel vectorized execution. And you can also dynamically execute it. Previous gentleman talked about CUDA. Fundamentally, programming GPU isn't that different ever since it's been essentially been set up by CUDA. It's essentially a way of saying um, you have to copy image data to the array, bring your passenger into some holding tank, then you bind the array to the texture and you run the kernel. You fly across the Atlantic. And then you unload it on the other side. These kinds of data movement is actually fairly common. Some designs hide the data movement. Some designs don't. Um, and that's really all it is. So a, switch of, uh, a, a quick switch here. Why, why, you know, what's, the, what's the difference with OpenMP? And I'm involved in ISO, and I design company-specific languages. A funny, you know, militaristic way to think about it. I think open M I saw it as a kind of a large aircraft carrier battle group. In order for it to maneuver, it takes some time, but it's getting much faster. It used to be 10 years. Now it's like five years. OpenMP is like a cruiser. It has a fair bit of firepower, but, and it can turn very, very fast. And, and we're, we're, we're standardizing every two years. Okay? Whereas a company-specific language can turn on a dime. It, Swift is, is something like that. And I know it's, they're trying to go more open source, but it starts out like that. And as a result, it can, turn, it can change very, very rapidly. A word about OpenMP and Pragmas. I, I know that a community here hates Pragmas. There's a good reason why OpenMP do, does that, and it's because it needs to support three languages without touching them, C, C++, and Fortran. And in order to do that fairly, so that similar constructs exist across all of these domains, it, use, it, it uses pragmas. But that doesn't mean the learning we gain from OpenMP's design can be taken into other domains, such as the design for WG21s. So what's OpenMP's <coughs> memory model, uh, model's aim? Well, it's all forms of accelerators. It's not just any specific one, com one companies. It's about DSPs, GPUs, and GPGPUs. You're going to see it in kitchen appliances, drones, signal processors, medical imaging devices, and not just high performance computing. So it's time to take a look at the model. It is honestly an ingeniously simple model. Other people have made the same comment. In about, in about five or 10 minutes, I hope to convey to you this model, where OpenMP essentially um, have these um, one host with multiple accelerator um, coprocessors right now of the same type, but later on we're gonna might potentially move that to a different, to, to many different types with an offloading of kernel computation onto these devices. Now, the big difficulty there is actually this, the memory movement. 
You don't actually want to swarm the devices with computation if it's not worth doing. And the thing is, in today's world, you have GPUs that are discrete from your CPUs, as well as GPUs that are semi-integrated or fully integrated to your, 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 your CPU. They're called APUs. Intel Xeon Phi is, such a, is a similar model. Okay? How do you program in such a diverse programming domain? OpenMP has to satisfy that. So it doesn't actually le legislate whether you have to copy data um, across if you, from CPU to GPU and back. Underneath, your, your, your quality implementation make that, make that determination, okay? Here it is, the OpenMP 4.0 device constructs. It's actually, it is simple. I mean, it's only like, it's only three different things. How to execute code on a target device, okay? And then the, the middle group just talks about, gives you a way to, ex, to explicitly control um, data movement from device to target and back and forth. And then there's a little third section at the bottom. That's actually there to enable for NVIDIA better because they have a slightly different architecture than Intel devices. I'm, I'm telling you, we are trying to target all devices. They have a two-level architecture. And so as a result, we need to be able to distribute for acceleration on those devices. Some terminology, it's not important for this discussion, but it's saying that we have to extend the, um, the code region um, in, OpenMP, in the OpenMP memory model so that it has its own data environment, so that a device appears to have an independent, appears to have an independent shared memory. Although copies cannot be assumed, as I mentioned, if they're actually shared, no copies are needed. In fact, in fact you should really pound on your, your vendor if he does that. There are data mapping attributes specifying how data mapping is moved. So instead of me t talking about it, let me just show you very quickly what it means. Okay. This is a slide that I've mentioned before. It's very important to get the data movement right. Um, because otherwise, you could be out of sync. You know, the races can occur. You could get the wrong value. Okay. Um, so as a result, the, 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 the three data, the, the, the three clause uh, constructs, one for target, transfers control flow to the target device, and target data construct creates a, a data environment on that device, so you don't have to keep transferring things back and forth. And then there's a target update device for you to synchronize back with the host. In picture, this is what it means, very simply. Data movements. If you want to move data to the host, to the device, you use the, you use the two clause. But before you do that, you have to allocate it on the device. That's the alloc clause of it. You can move data back, and that's the from clause in the map clause itself. You can move it back and forth to say to from. If you don't say anything, it assumes it's to from. Okay? That's it. That's the data movement. So how does this look in an actual target construct? Here I'm actually offloading some code to run on a target that's in red on the right. Okay? I've transferred control from the host to the device. But I do that by starting with this OMP target map clause construct, which is executed on host. And here specifically I say, I want to move data B to the device and, move the, and then map the data to um, C and D also to the device and bring the, the, bring the value of A, the result of A, back from the device. Okay? Now, this is still a synchronous construct. We do have an asynchronous construct later on, but right now, bear with me with the synchronicity here. And so the kernel itself is the parallel, re parallel region. That's executed on the target. And once that's done, the host, the host waits and then at the last curly brace, right brace there, the host is executing that. The other thing I mentioned, of course, is the data movement. So this thing is there to that, so that it avoids frequent, any, any kind of frequent transfers, overlap computations. So here's how you, how you play with this trick. You start out by, by setting up this OMP target data device um, clause, which is executed on the host. Okay? And it's got, you've, you're now already familiar with how the map clause works. There's some allocation, there's some input, and then you take something from result for the output that goes back to the host. Okay? Now, and then you execute your first, um, first parallel region. You specify which device you're going for. And then you come back to the host. You might do some other computation on the host. And then you want to go back to the target device. But at that point, the target, the data environment is already set up. So you don't have to, do, to, to reload it again. This kind of reload and back and forth movement is what actually really do slow down computation. If you want to synchronize with a host, you want to do this target update device. So the, this, this code is actually pretty identical to the previous one. And the only difference is the middle line where it says OMP target update device where it says, oh, I'm going to update the, the device um, data for input a little bit more because I, I know a little bit more, uh, more data now. Okay? And then in the next computation, it takes that additional 
uh, change, and then it's now synchronized. It could also be from as well, too, meaning I can take some partial calculations from the device, and then I might do some more work with it. Okay. You can also tag functions to be separately, uh, to have different ge code generations for, for host and device. Um, for instance, in this particular case, I bracketed um, some computation and final computation with this declared target construct. And on host, I would generate Intel x86 assembly like this. And on the device, I would generate specific assembly that is specific for the Intel Xeon 5 in this particular case. If it's an NVIDIA, it would look different, okay? So here now we get to asynchronous offloading. <laughs> This synchronous model doesn't work, doesn't, isn't very fast. It isn't gonna blow anyone away. The asynchronous model uses the OpenMP task construct such that when it's wrapped around a OMP target um, construct, it can now execute um, on, on the target, but the host keeps going and goes on and execute other tasks that follows it, okay? That gives you the advantage of tremendous speed throughput, but it's not enough if you're on an NVIDIA device. We know this because we have NVIDIA contributing actively to our discussion. And what they need to do is that they need to create a league of threads, teams, okay? And then these thread teams, so here's the interesting thing. On NVIDIA devices, blocks of threads are not synchronized, okay? So because of that, you have to do something fairly special. And I'll show you quickly what that means. I'm gonna skip past these and show you a standard Saxby type of computation. That is the typical high performance computation for summing AX plus Y. And here, you'll see me starting loading up the target, creating a tar target data environment. And then I'll create a teams of number of teams, okay? And you'll, do, you'll see that in, that in that graphics. These are blocks of threads with many threads spinning up, but only one is active. So it's not really doing anything great other than have lots of threads doing the same thing. But here's the trick. When you add this distribute keyword on top of it, it shows you that in the distribute case, I will now spin up um, without any barrier now, in this case, the second row of boxes, okay? And once it encounters the parallel region, that's when it can exploit the massive amounts of parallelism because now all the threads are spun up and what they do is they do this computation back here. They can now take the loop and spread it out, okay? Um, <coughs> such, such that um, the the middle, the, the first loop, i equals zero to i equals nine, is now spread out across the three blocks, okay? And then the computation for zero to six um, in the last loop is now, is now spread across all the threads within that block now, because they've spun up because of the distribute clause. That gives you a quick idea of the kind of things we do to make sure that it adapts to all devices, okay? If you're running on an Intel device, this is, and you have this code, it doesn't do anything, okay? All right, so what does the code base look like for Clang? We started with an initial version that was 3.5, and then it actually was mostly um, Intel's effort, all, and Alexei was one of the initial uh, founder of this. And we brought it, they brought it over and created the initial version. They added OpenMP Clang in a separate repository. And since the, um, the last couple of years, we've been upstreaming um, this to OpenMP to Clang 3.7. This is all up to OpenMP 3.1. 3.1 doesn't have the offload constructs, the target constructs that I've been talking about. Right now, we're, we're actively integrating that into the 3.8 trunk, which I assume is 3.8. And it's so the current version contains both the OpenMP offload support as well as the next version of Open, OpenMP, which is 4.5, which is gonna be ratified in about two weeks, I suspect, okay? The architectures, there are other, many other players involved, but the OpenMP 4 support in Clang has been a massive joint effort of, uh, at designing this offload model specification, this interface with LLVM, which, which uh, Alexei is gonna show. It's been involved with code drops, code reviews with the community. So the, co the contributors um, uh, uh, across IBM, Intel, Texas Instrument, DOE, AMD, as well as other distinguished members of the client community, for which I wanna call out Richard Smith, uh, John McCall, uh, Chandler, who's been guiding us along the way as well too. So, that's been helping us to solidify this effort. You actually have seen this already in a few other slides. I think the previous uh, gentleman actually, already, so it's not that different. We have an input program for C and C++ that goes through this OpenMP enable compiler, which is Clang, okay? And it generates these fat binaries, which inside is for fat binary for good reason, because it contains both the host code and the device code. 
And the host code separates into a host runtime library, and the device code separates into a device runtime library, and they end up all get merged back together at the end into, a, for, into an execution on a host machine with multiple attached devices. That's the key. The way we're doing it is that we're not just targeting NVIDIA or Intel. You could potentially target multiple devices. Okay? And this is a learning we want to take forward as we design the next, ver the next generation of GPU accelerated computing. So here, for instance, my company is interested in using power on, on, on NVIDIA de devices using the CUDA API. Alexei's company is interested in using essentially the Intel Xeon Phi, yeah. and that's the place they would sit. This is a fairly simple diagram that shows you essentially some of the huge complexity inside. There's driver preprocessors. The driver essentially preprocesses the input file using host or target preprocessors. And then for each source file, the driver essentially spawns a job using the host tool chain and some additional job for each target specified by the user. You can use flags to tell the front end that we're compiling code for a target. Um, for a target. So only the relevant target regions are considered. Saves a lot of space. And you have the target linker creates a self-contained, no, no undefined symbols image file. And then this image file is embedded as is by the host linker into the host fat binary. And then the host linker is given information to generate the symbols required by the RTO. This is in our specification, and Alex A is going to go over that. So I'm going to close with where we are right now. When, right now, we have initial implementation that's available on Clang Trunk. First patches are committed to, tr to Trunk. That contains target in the target directives. Um, I think it's like target, target update, target data, mm -hmm. I think. No. Just target. OK, just target. Just target. OK, the, 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 the Trunk one now is upstreaming some of that. So there's several patches under review. And I'd like to, for that, I'd like to hand off to, to Alexei. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. So let's talk a little bit about implementation details of support coding features uh, in Clang OVM. And we start with a small example. Uh, so what's going on here with this example? At first, we need to initialize our uh, target devices. Uh, then we allocate some memory for our uh, local variables, local arrays, v1, v2, and p. Uh, then we copy the data for our input variables, v1 and v2, from the host uh, to the target devices. And then we execute the code on the target, some code on the target devices. Then again, we execute some code on the host. In our uh, example, it is a function call of function init again, which reinitializes variables v1 and v2 with some input values uh, and synchronize the data between the host and the data. Uh, and then again, execute some code on the target devices. Then uh, we get the results from the target devices back to the host uh, and they allocate the memory for all our uh, local variables u1, v2, and p. This is how it works. So uh, to make it work, we need at first to build a so-called fat binary or multi-target binary. Yeah. Um, to make it, Clang have uh, Clang has to make uh, to generate object files for each uh, target device we are going to use. Then uh, target tool change shall combine uh, these objects into uh, target specific uh, binaries, and then host linker shall combine uh, these uh, binaries along with the host object files into a single executable, multi target uh, executable file. To do it, we need to support new driver option OMP targets, which uh, has a list uh, of uh, additional targets, target devices, uh, which we are going to use. And you can see an example of using of this uh, driver option. In this example, we are going to generate code for two uh, target devices, for uh, NVIDIA and for Xeon Phi, with this new driver option. So how it works? When you execute your final FED binary, it uses uh, interfaces provided by special uh, runtime library, libomp target library, uh, which utilizes interfaces of uh, target devices specific of load runtime libraries uh, to communicate with some particular target devices like Xeon, Phi, like NVIDIA, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, here we have uh, in this scheme 
we have three main objects, actually. The first one is a fat binary, which we discussed already a little bit. The second one is libomp target library, and the third one is a target specific of load runtime libraries. So, uh, libomp. Oops. Something, something broken here. Okay, thanks. Uh, so here is the interface of libomp target library. As you can see, this library is quite simple and quite small. It provides a set of uh, functions to initialize uh, the target device, uh, to send the data to the target device, to allocate the data on target device, and to run the code on the target device. Also, it has some additional functions to uh, make it in a synchronous way. But still, this library is quite small and quite simple. Uh, target of load runtime libraries. Also, these, simple, uh, these libraries are quite small and quite simple. They allow us to get the type of the devices uh, which uh, this target of load uh, library uh, is intended to work with. Uh, to get the number of installed devices, available devices which we can use for acceleration, yeah? Uh, initialize device, uh, devices, allocate some memory on these devices, delete some memory on these devices, et cetera, et cetera. All required functionality. So, again, let's back to our example and let's talk how it works actually with these runtime libraries. How it's going to work, actually. Uh, at first, we need to initialize our target devices, so we register our runtime library and try to, ident to identify which external devices are available for us, uh, which we can use for acceleration. And we, at first, we're trying to, use, to find some Xeon Phi devices. Yes, we have one. It says, yeah, I'm alive. I'm here. You can use me. So, okay, we will use you. Then we try to use some uh, GPU devices, but unfortunately we don't have GPU devices on our system, so we won't use uh, the GPUs for acceleration. And the same situation we have with uh, some DSPs. So we use only Xeon Phi accelerators for uh, offloading. Uh, then we need to allocate the data for, uh, to allocate the buffers for our local variables, V2, V, uh, V1, V2, and P on the target device, and send uh, initial data for variables V2 and V1, uh, V1 and V2 uh, to the target device from the host. And then we can start execution of the code uh, on the target device by uh, loading binary image uh, from the host to the target. And execution of this binary image on, on the target device. So we have, so now we have a result in our resulting array P on the target device. Then again, we execute some piece of code on the host, reinitializing variables V2 and V1. Uh, and synchronize uh, the, uh, the data between the host and the target by sending new input values for V1 and V2 uh, from the host to the target devices. So now we have new input values. Then again, we execute some piece of code on uh, target device. The scheme is the same as before. And at the end, we need to get the result from the device, from the target device. Uh, we download the results from the target device and allocate some previously allocated memory for variables v1, v2, and p. And that's all. So what is the current status of uh, libomp target and uh, target-specific runtime libraries? We have source code for these libraries in our GitHub repository. And uh, we have a patch which adds these libraries uh, to LVM3. This patch is currently is under review. Uh, currently, these libraries 
LibOMP target library has platform neutral implementation for, uh, which was tested for uh, uh, which was tested on Linux for x86-64 and PowerPC platforms. And we have uh, an NVIDIA version of this library uh, tested with CUDA. Uh, as to offload target uh, runtime libraries, we have uh, versions for Xeon 5, for PowerPC, and for NVIDIA. So, who, who is going to use Clang with OpenMP support and especially offloading features of OpenMP uh, in Clang. Actually, there are many companies are going to use uh, Clang with OpenMP support and with offloading features of OpenMP. As you can see, AMD, IBM, Intel, Texas Instruments, Department of Energy has many plans on uh, using Clang with, Open, uh, with OpenMP support uh, in their projects. So here is the current status of our work. As you can see, offloading uh, is a very important feature uh, of OpenMP standard. And uh, many companies are going to use this feature in their projects. So we develop, we're working actively on support of this feature in Clang LVM. And you can join us and help us with this work. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Okay, so what would be the effort, for example, to port this library to OpenCL? Sorry? What would be the amount of effort to, of work to, to, to port uh, your infrastructure for OpenCL, for example, just to have a rough Friday? What is the effort? What is the amount of effort it would take to port this library to OpenCL? Well, I don't think that uh, you have to make some, a lot of efforts to port this library to OpenCL. So, yeah, one to do is separate the target independent aspects of this um, so that it would be under different projects. Um, so in this particular case, um, um, much of the same um, functionality could be essentially be also be exploited with OpenCL. I know that this is something of great interest, which is why I mentioned OpenCL and SQL as well too. Okay. Yeah, client generates independent platform neutral code, so you just uh, need to rewrite some runtime libraries. And right, some funks or something like that yeah. over the layer. Mm -hmm. so, this is, uh, so. Okay. Is there currently a, um, a benchmark suite uh, for OpenMP uh, offloading? Okay, so there, there is a, there is um, um, in the um, spec HPC, High Performance Computing Benchmark, they have an open, they have an Excel benchmark, an Excel part of the suite, actually, that's been actively being worked on right now by contributing from many companies. And Intel's there, um, IBM's there, I think NVIDIA's there, Pascal's there. And they are developing this because this is such a new field. Um, it really needs, it really cries out for a really good set of benchmarks. The problem is, the problem is, you know, along with all the other problems that bench development is, how to be fair to every company, right? So, as you can see in the design, there are some things that Intel do really well at. You know, I can be afford to be neutral because I work for IBM, but you know, Intel generally does do really well with SIMD and vectorizations, right? Nvidia does really well with massive parallelism that's unsynchronized between blocks. So, so. You, as you can see, that's been that that's a bit of a battleground right now. Is the what is the what is the best benchmark that shows off each best? And you know what? That's just going to work its work its way through. And um, um, they've they've already have a bunch of benchmarks that um, that essentially uses a cross of OpenMP directives and OpenACC directives. Okay. So as as, as a result, um, I anticipate that that that's going to reach um, a kind of a crescendo in about. 
two, a year, two years or so. Okay. All right. Over there. Um, a lot of those devices have different limitations with respect to like IEEE 754 and single precision and things yeah. like that. Yeah. Is that reflected in the OpenMP standard in any way? So the question is, a lot of these devices have different limitations we, we, uh, with respect to the floating point IEEE 754 specifications. And that is something that needs to be continued to be ex explored and worked on. I think every across the domain, everybody has to work on that. Um, across all of these programming models that I've been showing, none of them actually really specifically, as far as I know, uh, do a really good job of addressing that floating point, uh, that floating point aspect. So yeah, I think it is something. I think the gamers definitely want to do, want, want, want that. Okay. Uh, very interesting work. I'm just uh, curious: is there any long-term plans for interaction with um, MPI? Um, ah, okay. For example, support for X10 language or just okay. message passing languages and environments. Right, so the question is, is there any long-term plans to extend the language to support MPI, which is a um, message passing interface? Um, so typically, the domain of OpenMP and MPI have been, it's kind of been, you know, separate, separated. MPI works with distributed systems. OpenMP works with traditionally shared memory systems. That has changed, actually. Um, one of the things that I changed when I came on board with OpenMP was to change the mission statement. So that OpenMP now has broken away from just shared memory. Effectively, accelerators have already done that for us, right? Accelerators is not sometimes sometimes accelerators are not not shared. They are on a district. They are on another node. So um, there are two parts to it. MPI has also initiated a shared memory model design, and OpenMP. If you think about how accelerators work, they also can work in a distributed manner, if you do it. In fact, there's a paper about that. Um, I think the end goal that I want to say, say to is that um, I think MPI and OpenMP continues to work very well together, regardless of these kinds of forays into each other's territory, if you can call it that. So I, I think that will continue. I think that's always been the intent. I think for the DOE labs, they are keenly interested in keeping the two working well together. and. Um, um, so I, I think that that's going to definitely continue. Question? Um, so this focused on the offloading part. Are you going to upstream Pragma SIMD and things like this too? It is upstreamed already. It is already. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Was, yeah. The question was about some how, exceptions. But yeah. The question was about have we done Pragma SIMD, uh, OpenMP SIMD yet? And yes, um, we upstreamed that to the trunk. Yep. So that's the end of talk. Let's give our speakers another round of applause.